this comment, this comment, this comment, and this comment. We have a lot to talk about, guys. After the storms died down on Friday, we had a lot of people in the comment section of our live stream asking us to recap what happened on Friday evening. What ingredients came together? What happened in Perry? What happened across the state? How did it happen? Why sirens didn't sound? How big was a tornado? How much damage was there? Well, here is your recap video for Friday evening storms. Emphasize that our wind shear that we need for damaging winds and also possibility of tornadoes, the wind shear for those doesn't really ramp up until after 8 p.m. The video you just saw us from our live stream on Thursday explained wind shear didn't really increase until after 8 p.m. on Friday evening. This is due to what we call a low-level jet, an increase in upper-level winds that moves into the area here, particularly after 8 p.m. But on Friday morning, looking at models and the real-time data, we kind of concluded that this would be a little bit sooner than 8 p.m. In addition to that, we went ahead and posted a forecast saying between 6 and 8 o'clock, the better wind shear would move in. You can see here on the model, the purples, blues, and light blues you're going to see there is your increase of your lowest level winds at about 4,000 to 5,000 feet off the ground. So you have good wind shear. What about moisture? Because we need moisture for severe weather as well. Well, we had plenty of that. This is your model showing humidity levels and also dew point levels, firmly showing Michigan and central and southern parts of Michigan firmly in the moist environment. So we have wind shear and we have moisture. What about helicity? Helicity is just basically put a measure of spin in the atmosphere at any given time. As we can see on the map here, we do have quite a large amount of helicity present in Michigan at 8 p.m. on Friday evening. As a result of this, we also have a model the output supercell composite, which is also just simply put a couple ingredients put together to figure out if supercells are likely. As we can see here, we have quite a bit of color in Michigan showing higher levels of supercells being possible. And lastly, looking at a forecast sounding, which is essentially just an x-ray of the environment, I want to focus on one thing here in particular, and that is our wind shear. These are called wind barbs. This is what winds are doing at any given point in the atmosphere with the bottom indicating the ground and the very top indicating the very upper level of the atmosphere. I want to highlight this section down here at the bottom. Do you see how the wind barbs are pointed southeast and about 10,000 feet off the ground they've pointed westward? That change of direction is called directional wind shear. Directional wind shear coupled with speed shear, which is an increase of speed with height, indicates that we could have rotating updrafts, including supercells, possible on that Friday evening. Seeing how the environment was coming together, the SPC went ahead and upgraded the risk to a slight risk, which is level 2 of 5, also adding a 2% designated area across central and southern parts of Michigan for a tornado or two possible. A very popular question Friday evening was, why didn't a tornado watch or a severe thunderstorm watch get issued? The very simple answer is, I don't know. I'm not the SPC, and the SPC is one who does that. But what I can do is give you some insight as to what the SPC was probably most likely thinking. Number one, this threat was contained to southern and central parts of Michigan, so it's not a very widespread area. For there to be a watch issued, number one, it needs to be widespread event. The second criteria would be a long-lived event. This was not expected to be a very long, widespread event. It was centered right between the 6 p.m. and the 10 p.m. time frame. By mid-afternoon, the SPC introduced an area of interest they were watching for a severe watch to be issued. The probability of one being issued was only 40%. I want to turn attention now to the actual radar that we had on Friday evening. As we can see, as we go into the afternoon and evening time frame, the coverage of the storms remained very isolated to scattered in nature, which is ultimately probably the reason why SPC did not issue the watch. Had there been more storms, a watch might have been issued. So take the DTX right off for Jackson. Oh yeah, look at that. By 6.30 p.m., we had cells developing right along I-69, pushing very slowly off to the east. This one riding just north of I-94 towards Jackson. 
I left my house in the Dundee area right around 640. And by about 730, I arrived to a point where I can get a visual on this storm. If you look at velocities here, where the bright greens on the very far and southwest side of that storm, that's really strong inflow. When you have that really strong inflow meeting with those really grayish red colors, it's indicative of rotation within that storm. I arrived just north of Napoleon at around 730, and this was my view. There you go. All right, so I'm just to the south and east of Jackson. Check this out. Whoa. So we have the storm precipitation right over here on the back side of it. We have a weak uh, mesocyclone rotation. That is most likely not rotating hard. It might be rotating very broadly, but that is probably most likely associated with the remnant wall cloud and or some broad rotation. So if that increases, we'll have to watch that close because that is very, very, um, this just looks like a funnel cloud from here. I'm still about five miles away from this, so it's really hard to see but that might be developing into a more developed wall here as you see it's starting to slant toward the rain i have cars coming but es essentially here um i have to watch the velocity on the storm close nick near jackson because this is quite concerning visually about five minutes later a train spotter reported a funnel cloud with this storm this video from storm chaser freddie bryant shows the funnel cloud clearly rotating and a few minutes later the nws and grand rapids issued a tornado warning for this storm Anyway, yeah, that's what I was saying here. This is your old mesocyclone. That's dying. As you can see, that's out. I want to pause the video right here very quickly and say, as storm spotters, we're trained to report what we see. Being five miles from this storm, it was very hard to visually confirm rotation, which is why I wasn't very excited about this storm on stream. But after reviewing footage from other chasers, that lowering to the right or my finger was actually an old funnel cloud that was decaying. So that was a confirmed funnel cloud, and that is what produced the tornado warning for this cell. New rain cooled air from this rain comes down, it feeds into this wall cloud, it builds a base, that base begins to rotate. That's going to be your new wall cloud area of interest again, just to the left of this old area. Tornado warning, including Jackson County, Michigan. This storm is now tornado warned. Seriously? Yes, tornado warning on the storm now, I'm right here. Yep. I want to pause the video again here and say Nick sounds shocked when he said seriously, and that is because radar indicated very little rotation at this time. This is because the radar beam from Detroit's radar was thousands of feet off the ground. It wasn't seeing what was at the very lowest level, which is what we're seeing here in the video. So the radar did not pick up rotation, which is why it shocked us. Our chaser Alex was also on this storm, but could only confirm very broad rotation with this wall cloud. Overall, the storm produced a couple funnel clouds, a huge photogenic wall cloud that scared a lot of local people, but overall, no touchdowns, injuries, or fatalities were confirmed with this storm. So great news out of Jackson County. And now I want to focus attention on the Perry tornado. The forecasted warm front at the time of the Perry tornado indicated that it was right over the Perry area. Warm fronts can enhance shear, lift, and Basically, it just enhance the overall sphere potential if the conditions are right, and the conditions happen to be right on Friday evening. If you recall earlier in the video, we focused on a forecast sounding. Also, we called an x-ray of the atmosphere. Well, sometimes on severe weather days, NWS offices will launch balloons with devices on them that can measure everything you see here in this profile of the atmosphere. They happened to launch this right at 8 p.m. from Detroit Pontiac radar site. I want to focus two things here on this sounding, number one being the wind shear yet again. As we also looked earlier, we have this what we call directional shear, where the winds are facing southeast at the surface. And as you go up in the atmosphere by about 10,000 feet, they're out of the west. This is called directional shear and can make updrafts rotate. Also discussed earlier, looking at models for today, we had what we called helicity in the atmosphere. That's your spin. In that forecast X-ray profile that was launched at 8 p.m., we see the SRH M2S2 below. You see 242 at the 1 kilometer, and you have 251 at the 3rd kilometer. For tornadic activity, you want to see those above 200, so sufficient levels there near the Perry area. And then lastly, your instability profiles, we had sufficient CAPE. Now, usually you want to see CAPE above 1,000. 
at the surface and next layer, but we had 954 and 914 respectively, so we had enough cape to get the job done. If you look back on radar, nothing really catches your eye here except when it gets just to the west of Perry here. You see those reds and greens literally light up on the velocity, but nothing tight indicating tornado was on the ground. Same instance as this storm as in Jackson where the radar beam was not picking up what was happening on the ground. The radar beam at this location was thousands of feet in the atmosphere. If we pause it and we circle the velocity where the broad rotation was showing up on radar, it matches up with a CC drop, which is a measure of what could be debris being lofted in the atmosphere. In this case, it was certainly debris being lofted from that tornado. I would also like to add to this, even though velocity wasn't too bright, this is why CC product is important because it can show us where debris is being lofted in areas with broad rotation. Videos that were sent into our page indicated this tornado was actually quite large. It wasn't a very, uh, very narrow, very skinny tornado. It was actually pretty fat. It was 430 yards wide, so over four football fields wide. Peak winds of 95 miles per hour, which is equivalent to EF1 status. And it moved right around three miles through the town of Perry. Our storm chaser, Joel Fritzma, was on this storm. However, because of the numerous trees, woods, terrain issues, and also cell phone service issues, he was unable to see the actual tornado, but could visually confirm that there was a rotating wall cloud. He was in Perry moments after the tornado struck and was able to grab all these photos you are now seeing of the damage within Perry. Being an only an EF1 tornado with winds of 95 miles per hour, the tornado did not damage anything too severely. It just took down a lot of trees, branches. It did take some shingles off some houses. It did collapse a pavilion that we know of. It also sheared off a cell phone tower, uh, very top, not sure what you call it, but the very top of a cell phone tower. It also took out the town's tornado siren. But other than that, no houses were destroyed, no lives were lost, and no injuries were reported in Perry. So great news. We're glad that this town stayed safe. As these damaged photos roll through, I just want to go ahead and get my final thoughts on this day. It was a well-forecasted day from MSC, the SPC, as well as the local offices from Detroit and Grand Rapids. There was definitely tornadic potential along that warm front and all throughout southern Michigan. So we're very lucky that the day did not be, the day wasn't bigger than it could have been just because the instability, as we had mentioned in our forecast, wasn't as large as what was forecasted. Had that cape been a lot larger than forecasted and the environment more unstable, we may have seen a few more tornadoes, maybe even a couple stronger tornadoes than what occurred. As of right now, this is the only tornado that has been reported in the state. There was a funnel cloud that may have touched down in the area of uh, Fenton, I want to say. That was from Chris Tobias, but that has not been confirmed at this time. I'll go ahead and leave you guys with the damage survey from the town of Perry from NWS Detroit. If you guys want to read through it, you are welcome to. But I want to take some time here at the end of the video and respond to people who are on our page saying things like the severe threat busted, I didn't see anything, this threat didn't happen, stuff like that. Weather is not an exact science, and just because your house or your town is not affected does not mean that others are not as well. The threat did include most of southern and central Michigan yesterday. However, it only was Perry that got hit by a tornado. That tornado could have been you, and it may be you in the future. It's not an exact science. We can't predict exactly where it's going to happen. We can only give you the general area and the risk areas that have the best ingredients to make it happen. So please, be considerable of other people and be respectful on our page.